Thank you very much, Martin. So Julius Caesar is dead. He was just killed on the Senate floor by a handful of conspirators who wanted to defend the Roman Republic against the rule of a tyrant, of a would-be king. Having perfectly clear conscience, Marcus Junius Brutus walks to the streets of Rome and publicly declares the reasons for their deed. His ancestors once banished the last king of Rome, Tarquinius Superbus, and helped establish the Republic in the first place. As such, Brutus is sure to win the approval of the people. And he does, initially. However, he and other conspirators make one fatal mistake. They agree that General Mark Anthony, Caesar's closest ally, should lead the funeral processions and also be allowed to speak to the populace of Rome. Brutus and other Republicans assume that Mark Anthony is a simpleton whose oratory skills are no match to those uh, of seasoned senators. It also seems that they rely too much on the assumption that people will naturally oppose tyranny and that they will love and defend their own freedom. Clearly, Brutus did not read Spinoza, for otherwise he would have known better, namely that people quite often fight stubbornly for their servitude as if it were their salvation. In William Shakespeare's dramatization uh, of these historic events, Mark Anthony delivers a speech worthy of a Mephistopheles. He uses many excellent rhetoric devices and strategies. He masterfully plays with the expectations of his listeners and ends up stirring uh, a revolt against Brutus, against the Republicans. The scene is quite long and in many ways constitutes the height of dramatic action. I want to focus on one specific point in this speech. So I'll read now uh, from Shakespeare, uh, from Mark Anthony's speech just after G uh, Julius Caesar uh, died and after Brutus has already made his own case. So Mark Anthony says, I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain blunt man that love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir man's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Thank you. This was my Mark Anthony speech from Julius <laughs> Caesar. <laughs> Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the perk of reading uh, literature. It's well written, you just have to quote a lot. What I find interesting, interesting in this rhetoric strategy is what we could call a denegation of oratory skill. Mark Anthony is ostensibly a straight talker, quote, a plain blunt man, and certainly, quote, no orator as Brutus is. Mark Anthony uses a strategy that we are very familiar with uh, from the experience of contemporary populists. They steal away the populace's hearts precisely by declaring they do, they, they do not come to steal away hearts, that they don't even know how to give speeches, that they can only speak from the heart or from the gut. There are so many points to be made about this rhetorical strategy. First, this rhetorical structure authorizes, legitimizes, le legitimizes the speaker by proxy. It is not in his own name that Mark Anthony wishes the people of Rome to revolt against the Republicans. The speaker assumes only the position of a close friend to the deceased, and it is in Caesar's name that Anthony makes his claim to power. More specifically, since he is no speaker, no orator himself, he is only the voice 
of Caesar's wounds. It is, so Anthony claims, the wounds themselves that speak, or would if they could, and stir people into revolt. In the perspective suggests that in this scene, political power requires a kind of rhetorical, or even theatrical, if you want, structure in order to manifest itself. The master's presence takes shape of an appearance, of a representation, of an avatar. The point is this. According to this rhetorical strategy, there is no master as such. There is no single person who may appear to us as the master, uh, but it may also not. The master only exists as his own appearance. Now, there is another moment in Shakespeare's play where the performative nature of political power is quite palpable. In one of the early scenes of the play, Julius Caesar, the senators discuss the future of Rome and the world, behind the scenes of a grandiose public event in Caesar's honor. In the background, they hear three shouts of public jubilation, and it turns out later that it was a political performance of a kind. Anthony, apparently, offered a mock crown to Caesar, as if in a jest, three times. But Caesar rejected the crown three times. We hear that uh, from a report of uh, one of the senators who was present. <coughs> I'm sorry. This performance described by that senator as merfoolery and accompanied by Cicero muttering something in Greek, which the senator couldn't couldn't understand, it was Greek to him, was met with great approval of the crowd. So assassinations of senators uh, who dare to express republicanism are already happening at the time. Caesar is de facto ruling as king, as dictator and imperator. Nevertheless, Caesar gains public approval and public consent precisely by rejecting the crown. In other words, Caesar legitimizes himself as a king through a, the very show of indignation for such honor. Uh, as he, he rejects the crown with the back of his hand. This is how it is reported to us. Again, the point is that legitimization of political power takes place as a strange kind of performance. The figure of the master takes shape through its own negation. I don't want crown. Oh, come on. The second point that I want to make about Mark Anthony's speech is the intertwinement of the dimension of power and truth. Anthony rests his argument upon the idea that truth does not require any embellishment, that making beautiful speeches and using the right words is not how truth is told. This, the strategy he uses is the strategy of nuda veritas, the naked truth. truth where it is the facts themselves, in a way, that speak. And what the facts say directly speaks louder than words. Anthony thus speaks right on, and only, I quote, shows sweet Caesar's wounds. If we take Mark Anthony seriously, if we don't immediately assume uh, that he's a Mistopheles, simply manipulating his audience, which of course he is, his theory of truth is perhaps surprisingly platonic. In the symposium, which is structured like a contest of speeches about love, Frauke, please don't run away. Are you here? She's not, oh, she ran away. I'm sorry. Uh, speeches about love, of eulogies to the god of love, Socrates begins his own speech by doing precisely what Mark Anthony is doing. Uh, if you recall uh, this moment in the symposium, uh, Socrates declares himself completely inept to give speeches. He, th there's a long passage where he says, oh, but I, I, I'm obviously an idiot. What did I, uh, what did I, why did I say, why did I um, ad uh, agree to present a speech about love? I, I cannot give speeches. I can only speak the truth about love. Would you be interested in that? They kind of are. So he uses the same strategy as Mark Anthony does. Plato consistently made the claim throughout his body of work that the true word will always defeat the artful word. The whole notion of the quarrel between philosophers and poets that Plato keeps talking about is Plato's way of arguing the truth has its value beyond the appearance. 
and that all embellishments and poetic artistry must cede ground to truth. For Plato, this is also a political claim. In political matters, truth triumphs, or at least it should triumph, over appearances. A politician displays his or her own authority by speaking the simple truth, which also means that if instead a politician speaks in beautiful metaphors or rhyme, he or she is probably not speaking the truth. Whether he wanted this or not, with the general idea that truth is the ultimate authority, Plato engendered an entire tradition of appreciation for straight talkers in the political domain. And what Shakespeare shows us in Mark Anthony, in a clear rebuke of Plato, is how the procedure of talking straight can very easily be used by populists to legitimize their positions. Uh, and as you know, in the symposium, Socrates di distances himself from the speech he gives, not only on the formal level by refusing to employ an embellished language and structure, but also on the level of the content. When uh, Socrates finally delivers his own understanding of love, he does not even speak in his own name, but simply recounts the teaching he was given in youth by a priest, by a mysterious female priest called Diotima. So the authority of truth is thus a kind of borrowed authority. And ironically, in a kind of revenge of the appearance, Shakespeare has Mark Anthony do precisely the same stunt as the one Socrates pulls. Anthony does not only deny his own oratory skills, but also claims to be nothing but a mouthpiece of some mysterious otherworldly authority. He's simply giving voice to sweet Caesar's uh, wounds. Poor, poor, dumb mouths. He's making those wounds into almost an erotic object. Shakespeare demonstrates efficiently and brutally that we can't simply say, as Plato would have wanted, that the authority is bound to the category of the truth. In any case, it is certainly not enough to speak the truth in order to win an argument, political or otherwise. One must also give the appearance of speaking the truth. So let me move now to my third and final point about Mark, Mark Anthony's speech. Uh, and it will concern the rest of my presentation. I want to comment on the wider context in which he assumed the role of the speaker, which is the death of Caesar. So the vantage point for my consideration is the, in this second part will be that Anthony draws his authority from the fact that Caesar died. My case here is that if Julius Caesar is one of the historical names for the master, then it is not so much as a living person with certain affirmative qualities, but precisely as someone dead. Historically, as you know, uh, Caesar is not considered a monarch uh, or the first emperor, even though he was obviously keen on uh, ruling as, uh, as one. It was Octavian who, after having defeated first the Republicans with the help uh, of Mark Anthony, and then Mark Anthony himself, became the undisputed single ruler uh, of the Roman world, and the first true uh, undisputed Roman emperor. Nevertheless, Octavian formulated his claim to power as Caesar's heir, adopting Caesar's name. And so the title of the emperor in many European languages, for instance in Slovenian, is simply a derivation of Caesar's name, like Kaiser in, in German. Quite literally, Octavian Augustus ruled as a Caesar, the, the second Caesar, but the first emperor. There's kind of like, there's two Caesars. There's one, but there's two. Hegel famously described this interplay between Caesar and Augustus, between Caesar and Caesar, as a historical repetition. Caesar had to be repeated, so to speak, in Augustus, so that the Roman world would accept the rule of one as something necessary and not a mere coincidence in the person of Julius Caesar. Speaking about the cunning of reason, Hegel argues that in history, Ideas are enforced or gain reality only through and by the death of individuals. That is, the blood of individuals, uh, uh, that it is the blood of individuals that is sacrificed, so to speak, on the altar of the idea. In the example of Julius Caesar, we can see very clearly how it was precisely the death of the individual Caesar that helped establish the concept of Caesar as the name of the master, uh, as the name uh, of the undisputed uh, line of emperors. I claim that Shakespeare captures this uh, Hegelian point beautifully 
in Anthony's speech. As mentioned before, it is not so much Caesar as a living individual that matters, rather Caesar functions as the figure of the master precisely insofar as he is dead. Julius Caesar as the king that never was is, I claim, a very effective figure of the master. Hegel's concept of the world historical individual about which Andrew Cole spoke on Thursday should be, I think, uh, understood accordingly. One is not a world historical individual because one has a set of qualities or because one has achieved great feats during his or her lifetime. What makes world historical individual what he or she is, is that great historical transformations became associated with them, or more specifically, with their name. Whereas as living individuals, they may, not, they may have not even survived the process. I will move now to Hegelian topics specifically and leave Shakespeare's play behind. Hegel mentions death in reference to the master elsewhere too, and much more directly. Notably, of course, in the passage on master and slave, or lord and bondsman, in the phenomenology of spirit, where death takes the center stage. To cut the long story short, especially since it was recounted uh, quite recently by, uh, by Goran and by other speakers, and especially since I all, uh, only want to focus on one very specific problem within the dialectic of master and slave, um, I want to point out that Hegel stages a kind of mortal combat between the two consciousnesses, arguing that each has to stake its own existence in order to prove to the other as well as to oneself that they are indeed self-consciousnesses. This is quite essential for Hegel. He writes, I quote, they must engage in this struggle, for they must raise their certainty of being for themselves, für sich, to truth, both in the case of the other and in their own case, end of quote. So it is a question of proving oneself to oneself as well as to the other. The natural existence must be despised in order for the self-consciousness to prove itself. But then how does the figure of the master even come into play? Perhaps surprisingly, master and slave emerge as the result of an unsuccessful, or rather an, an incomplete, life and death struggle. Only the extreme opposites die, and natural death, Hegel writes, does not produce recognition. Uh, let me quote. For just as life is the natural setting of consciousness, independence without absolute negativity, so death is the natural negation of consciousness, negation without independence, which thus remains without the required significance of recognition." End of quote. Hegel describes in this passage death as a natural, I, I underline this word, as a natural negation of consciousness. And its philosophical significance is the same as that of life, natural life. Natural life does not suffice to attain recognition but natural death also doesn't help. This may seem a rather obvious point, that death doesn't help you, but it's actually a much more complicated point. It is only the natural death that does not bring recognition. However, death in the philosophical sense, death as something that belongs to spirit, is a different matter entirely, and we will return to this. Now, the relationship between master and slave emerges among the living. Initially, their relationship is defined by the fact that one self-consciousness decided to cling to dear life after all, and it is called the bondsman or slave consciousness. The most important point of their relationship is when it turns out that their status of dependency or insufficiency, Selbstständigkeit and Unselbstständigkeit, is actually inverted. I'm just recalling this back to memory. It turns out that it is the slave or the bondsman that is truly independent with relation to work and its fruits. For my purposes here, what matters is how Hegel justifies this, this, uh, this move towards wh why is the bondsman uh, consciousness or the slave consciousness the actual independent self-consciousness. And I'll read the whole passage. I think Goran mentioned this passage and Mladen mentioned it in his talk briefly. I'll read the whole passage. A very well-known passage, one that worked, I think, its way even into the Communist Manifesto. Uh, so Hegel says this. For the consciousness of the bondsman 
has been fearful, not of this or that particular thing or just at odd moments, but its whole being has been seized with dread, for it has experienced the fear of death, the absolute Lord slash master. So, um, Pace, Peter Klepets, there is a concept of the absolute master. Death, the absolute master. In that experience, it has been quite unmanned, has trembled in every fiber of its being, and everything solid and stable has been shaken to its foundations. But this pure universal movement, the absolute melting away of everything stable, is the simple, essential nature of self-consciousness. Absolute negativity, pure being for self, das reine für sich sein, which consequently is implicit in this consciousness. End of quote. It's quite a beautiful quote as well. So what I want to focus on is the idea that death is the absolute master. This is quite distinct, I claim, and I want to underline this, from death as mentioned in the previous passage, the natural death. Death which did not bring any recognition. In this passage, death in the form of the experience of the fear of death is precisely that which produces self-consciousness in its purest form. This is death not as a natural process, but as a, as a social and political force. I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this because I think it's really important. Hegel is speaking about fear and trembling, about an angst, which is not simply an occasional fear of something in their life. This consciousness's whole being has been seized with dread. Um sein ganzen Leben Angst haben. This may strike someone as surprisingly Heideggerian uh, passage in Hegel. I think Goran even talks, uh, talked about in his speech uh, about some sort of existentialist drama. However, however, for Heidegger, death and angst are instances of isolation of self-consciousness. For Heidegger, one is always alone in death. Uh, for Heidegger, angst is an existential disposition of human being but he draws conclusions which are quite opposite to Hegel's. As far as Heidegger is concerned, he would pronounce these kind of platitudes all over his work, no one can die our death in our stead. For Hegel, however, and this is again absolutely cr crucial as, as far as I'm concerned, death is something profoundly social and political or spiritual. So not a moment of isolation, but a political and social moment. Uh, and I'll, I'm coming to the, to the finale. I'll just mention another passage from Phenomenology of Spirit, uh, where the social, ethical, and political nature of death is very clear, also, uh, very, very clear also and in the foreground, which is the passage on Sophocles' Antigone, another Greek place, um, uh, uh, bearing the title on, on ethical life, on Zittlichkeit. Uh, so Hegel is discussing the burial rites, um, which, uh, which he describes as the fundamental ethical injunction of every family, granting the deceased family member a status of someone who belonged to the political community. The burial rites have precisely the function of denying that a person died but a natural death. The burial rites add to the natural death a movement of consciousness, uh, some, some sort of an action, a deed, writes Hegel, is inscribed in the, in, the, in the burial rites. I'll read another passage from Hegel uh, from, from, um, you know, from, from, from his comments on Antigone. This universality which the individual as such attains is pure being, death. It is a state which has been reached immediately in the course of nature, not the result of an action consciously done. So in the first move, he's talking about natural death. Someone naturally just died. Well, maybe he was killed, but still it's a natural death. The duty of the member of a family is on that account to add this aspect uh, in order that the individual's ultimate being too shall not belong solely to nature and remain something irrational, but shall be something done and the right of consciousness be asserted in it. So this is why we have natural uh, burial rites, he says, because uh, we want to claim that the person who died was not only uh, a natural being. 
Uh, so the, the ritual of burial is the essential work of the family because it is in this ritual that family has its purpose beyond the natural bond between family members. This is, I'm condensing a, a wider argument. So the family for Hegel in, in, uh, in his passage on Antigone is problematic because it's a natural uh, ethical bond. And so he, he shows how family redeems not only the, the family member, but also itself from that natural bond. But there is a similar process underway also in the institution of political community, of Gemeinwesen, which, as Hegel insisted, must be upset by the government. This is really interesting. Must be upset by the government from time to time by war so that the systems of particular interest that constitute the community do not become fixed and so that the individuals, I quote, are made to feel in the task laid on them in the war their lord and master, death, end of quote. This is actually how Hegel explains, like that, that's his functional explanations of the necessity of wars. Why are there wars where gov governments have to decide from time to time to inflict death upon their citizens in order to bring them back to the, uh, to the so the spirit lives. Uh, in philosophy of right, he actually uh, continues this point. He quite directly speaks about the ethical importance of wars. So in short, death has a social and political importance for Hegel, and is far from an isolating force where each of us is ultimately alone. When Hegel considers death as the absolute master, which he does consistently, it is more than just a convenient phrase he uses for dramatic effect. It indicates that any other figure of the master, like a monarch, is necessarily a kind of appearance. However, this does not mean a false appearance as if there exists a true master somewhere in hiding. To return to a point I made with regard to Julius Caesar, it simply means that there is something irreducibly theatrical in the way how the master exists. Okay, I just want to add uh, one, final, uh, one final point uh, about this difference between Caesar and Caesar, between the master and the ruler. Uh, Hegel himself comments on a, a particular historical moment when the emissaries of Erfurt, uh, which was directly linked to Napoleon, uh, to, under his jurisdiction, they, uh, they addressed him as notre prince. And he retorted, Je ne suis pas votre prince, je suis votre maître. So Hegel, Hegel, uh, Hegel comments on this in a different context, but this difference between prince and maître is, is, is what I'm trying to play with here. Uh, this difference between, uh, between Caesar and Caesar, between the master and the ruler, the emperor, or whatever. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Gregor, for this clear and pointed lecture. Now, the, no, there should be some questions. Yeah. Okay. Hvala za možnost vprašanja. Dovolite, da vprašam v slovenščini, ker se bom mlaže izrazil. Ta konferenca je posvečena gospodarju v sodobnih strukturah oblasti. Tak je naslovljeno. In poglejmo, kdo so gospodari v današnji družbi. Če čist pritlehno povemo, so tisti, ki imajo moč, ne? ki si želijo svobodo, svoboda je povezana z močjo in moč, želja pomoči, potreba pomoči je eno temeljnih psihosocialnih potreb vsakega človeka. Torej, da v stvari da si življenje krvi, kakor njemu odgovarja, da ga peljet ja. Ampak, če govorimo in, in še v tem je moč, da pridobiš oziroma prisiliš, da imaš to možnost, da ljudje ravnajo, kakor ti želiš. V tem je moč. Ne? In to je politična moč, gospodarska ali kjer, kjerakoli govorimo. Ampak o tej moči govorimo. In današnjo to moč podeljuje v današnjem svetu vedno bolj sploh s pohodom neol neoliberalizma, free market, svobodni trg, ki je postalo edino mesto, bi rekel skor, resnice, kjer ti prideš do te... Ja, vprašanja. Vse bom na koncu povedal. Samo obrazložitev je potrebno, kje je moč, 
kje kako prideš in da je ta postal pravzaprav veliki drugi, ta primarket ali če mu rečemo tudi status Boga, ki podeluje moč in je mesto resnice. In zdaj ti, ko se prebijajo in ko so se prebijali do tja, te so zaljubljeni v moč, demon moči jih obladuje, to so gospodarji, ki so bolj v zadju, niso toliko spredjo, ampak kdaj bo ta gospodar, a vidimo mi, ki je gospodarja v dobrem smislu, da bo poskrbel za skupno dobro. Ker to, kamor gre, brez gospodarja ne gre smo ugotavili te dneve in da to, kamor gremo zdaj, gre v uničenje, gre v konec. Kje je zdaj tist gospodar, če lahko ponudi filozofija s svojo subjektivnostjo, duhovnostjo, čustvi, ki obranate čustva, namere, ideje, smisel, ki išče, ne, če ima nekje tu odgovor, če ga vidi, če je kje na horizontu, to je vprašanje. Ja, super, hvala. So, thank you. The gentleman was asking about free market as the seat of truth, power and God, kind of like a religious theological moment in it. And he was wondering, whereas philosophy has an answer, you know, how shall we enable, how does philosophy seek to produce a new kind of master which will take care of the of the whole world as a community of citizens. And I just want to quickly respond that um, uh, I agree with you on the first part and on the second part, uh, your question, I'd say that like in philosophical history, in, in the history of philosophy, there has consistently been philosophers like Immanuel Kant who would write, uh, 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 who would write, um, Idee zu einer allgemeinen Geschichte in weltbürgerlicher Absicht. So, I don't know what the title is in English. So, they would write um, pieces where they would even argument that the history shows that humanity is slowly progressing towards a kind of cosmopolitan humanity. Uh, now, whereas, uh, of course, uh, philosophy cannot possibly answer, whereas that kind of uh, cosmopolitan humanity, which does seem like, sure, let's go for it, uh, but how it will be actually attained if it actually will, that remains a completely open answer and something that philosophy has proven not to be able to respond to. So I'll try not to embarrass uh, philosophers any longer. Uh, Peter? Oh, uh, Bara? Yeah, I, ha I have just one uh, small uh, question. Uh, like, I would like you to clarify something. Um, uh, about this uh, deaths, uh, the death, uh, the, the burial and so on. Um, I think like among, uh, let's say, Ljubljana school, there is a um, kind of um, like uh, reading, like uh, kind of um, a great reading about the difference of between uh, real death, like physical death and symbolic death. Symbolic death, it's death that uh, uh, we as people are like of course physical beings but we are all always as subjects inscribed in the symbolic tree interpolation and so on um, and the symbolic that would be like kind of the um, when uh, the subject is some somehow like disappears from the symbolic loses his symbolic inscription and so on and uh, the third um, the third thing uh, is, uh, the sp is the burial. So uh, the, the, all the, um, um, sorry, I'm so tired now, I would like to speak just, in Slovene. Yeah, just, just, no, no, just, <laughs> just go. Um, uh, all the, um, um, uh, the, 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 um, sorry. Um, so the burial um, uh, pr uh, pr uh, Right. Procedure. Oh, so the, some the, the symbolic uh, status of the burial, it has another function. It's not like it doesn't have the function of his ins inscription in the sim uh, of the subject in the symbolic, and it doesn't have a function of uh, deleting someone from the symbolic. So um, I I think um, I'm sorry I'm complicating, but. Uh, People would normally, like normally, many times, be understanding that symbolic death is the the, the burial, the symbolification of death itself, which is like, uh, which is actually the wrong understanding of the concept of symbolic death, which is actually 
de deleting somebody from this from the yes, symbolic. As far as, so as I far was, as yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 just sorry. The question would be that. So, if Caesar, uh, who was already inscribed in the symbolic, like massively, so um, the 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 function of the burial procedure and your thesis that with that with his death, he only came into the like. Um, to become a historical figure or like totally inscribed in sim symbolic. Maybe, uh, I wouldn't agree with this, but maybe the burial procedure would only do something in the symbolic, like kind of underline or fix or something. And, um, uh, and I think this is it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bara. So first of all, uh, I, my take on, uh, on how Hegel understands death, uh, natural or symbolic, uh, or he would say spiritual or whatever. Uh, no, no, sorry, my point would be that there's no concept of symbolic death in Hegel. I don't think there is. Like, there is th natural death, uh, but that's a, good, that's a good thing. That's a very kind of Christian, I'd say, understanding of death. Uh, natural death is a good thing because it marks the birth of symbolic life. Um, so this also, I think, answers uh, to your question, uh, you know, what would be uh, the 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 function of the burial rites in relationship to the symbolic, it would be the initiation into the symbolic world. Uh, so once you die, you are properly uh, asserted to be part of the symbolic world. Of course, Hegel says that, um, like, you know, so <laughs> it's hard to survive one's own death, but this is basically what, uh, for Hegel, is the point of being human. I mean, this is also how I read uh, back the, the passage on, uh, on, um, uh, on slave and master. So the slave is the one who already died in a way, who already had this natural death experienced. And this is why he becomes the, the, the proper, um, the proper um, selbstständig, so independent um, self-consciousness, because he has already survived his own death. So, sorry, let's have more questions and then we can return to you. Is that okay? I just wanted to say one second. <laughs> okay, Eric, please. Um, wonderful uh, talk. And I was, I, I, I'd like to ask my question by way of a comment first. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you, yes. Which is, um, I, I, th I think the way you distinguish Heidegger and Hegel is, is not right. Okay. Um, and I mean, I mean, for, um, I mean, Heidegger specifically distinguishes, you know, dying from perishing. I mean, so in a certain sense, you know, from just living to being in the world. And there's no, like, you know, tormented soul, you know, I, I, anxiety and isolation. An anxiety is, the, is, in a certain sense, the way you assume your place in history. So it's, it's, it can sound like it's, you know, um, existential, but I think he, Heidi would have said, no, that's, an inc that's not the right reading. But that leads to my next question about the ma really uh, um, death anxiety and the master. I mean, I think we all know here the experience of f thinking, shit, I was wrong. <laughs> um, everything I've been thinking, my God, it's wrong. Um, do I really change my mind? Or do I somehow save it? You know, do I somehow, somehow find a way to, in a way, not give up all this <laughs> stuff I've been doing and go back, you know, go back to the drawing board, start again? And it, this does feel like, you know, uh, like it's like a death anxiety. You know, because who you were, who you were clinging to as the person who had those ideas, those thoughts, what does it mean to actually say, no, it was it was wrong, and it seems like the master is the one who has done that, who's capable of doing that, who could actually say, no, this was wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I I actually have changed my mind, and and is then maybe able to tell a story about why, you know, they were wrong. But it seems that I think we all know this experience of clinging to what we we're <laughs> the way we've been thinking. Um, and that is, and that's what makes, you know, in a certain sense, you know, a, um, you know, a body of thought into a kind of I, almost an ideological apparatus. 
an institution um, because of this, you know, in a way, the clinging. And I'm wondering if the true master, you know, we learn from is the one who somehow is able to, mm -hmm. you know, not cling to the life of, of the body of thought. Right. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, so about the Heidegger comment, I'm not claiming that Heidegger is stupid. I love our uh, Heidegger discussions. Uh, it, this goes back 10 years, I think. Uh, your first talk in Ljubljana was somehow related to Heidegger, and I remember asking you about Heidegger. <laughs> anyway, so I'm very happy uh, to do this. I, I'm not claiming that Heidegger is stupid. Of course he distinguishes between natural death and death as uh, existential. Of course he does that. I'm claiming that death as existential for Heidegger uh, results, whether he wants this or not, in a kind of existential list. Uh, um, uh, conclusion, which would be that basically we are alone in our death. Yeah. And I don't think that's quite what Hegel is trying to say. Being what you're alone in our death is the way you are Now, OK, you're saving Heidegger there. I, I'd say you're saving Heidegger there. Um, clinging. <laughs> you're clinging to your Heidegger. That's fine. All right, about the, uh, about the second comment that you made, I, I am extremely sympathet sympathetic to it. I would say that this would be proper Hegelian concept of the master. So once we understand that death has nothing to do with natural death, that death is a uh, symbolic instance, uh, cultural or spiritual, as he would say, instance, once we accept that, of course, death is precisely a kind of, you know, someone, uh, you know, ended something. Someone said, okay, this is done, let's see the next play. Uh, and whether the next play will have something to do with uh, what we've seen before or not, we don't know. But uh, the master would be like this, you know, the show is there, but the master would be the curtain that falls. So in, if, if that's something that uh, resonates, it does to me, but if that's some, something that for you as well resonates to what you were saying, um, as, uh, you know, master is the the instance of the realization that we did something wrong and we have to start over, then I think I could completely agree with you. Yeah, uh, Gregor, thank you for this wonderful and rich presentation. You were, uh, as always, brilliant. And, it was uh, all Shakespeare. Uh, it was all Shakespeare, yeah, <laughs> our master. Uh, I have just two things, um, a comment or actually a, a question. In the beginning of your presentation, you were speaking about the wound. And uh, the, the, the wound. wound, wound. Oh, wound. the wound. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, everybody is speaking in the name of the wound. Uh, and here, uh, uh, the question is similar to Baras and Eric's. You know, uh, here we can somehow differentiate uh, a symbolic and real dimension in okay. a way that uh, uh, in political, in, in politics, there's a political representation which is a bad press now. So somebody speaks in the name of the people. Do you find it uh, different when somebody speaks in the name of the wound? And does this relate to the differentiation between the ruler and the master mm -hmm. which you ended your paper? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think that um, speaking in the name of the people is very obviously, it's like bad, it's being bad Mark Anthony. It's like, really, really, you are speaking in my name? You dare speak in my name? That's very obviously bad strategy. I would not, like, if you're a populist, I would advise you not to say that you're speaking, or like that you're speaking in the name of little people. Please, like, I mean, if you're gonna be a populist, you have to do better. This is really bad. Um, so uh, I think speaking on, on behalf of someone who is dead, that is much more effective. Okay, yeah. Okay, this, this shifts a little problematic, but I won't, won't dwell on that. Just a little that might seem hair splitting, but to food, food, food for thought. You said that master exists as his own appearance. It would be worthwhile considering whether one should say master exists as, uh, and as his own double. Mm -hmm. So the dialectics of appearance and the double, it's quite different. And then it's also related to to, to, to the problematics of appearance in Hegel and in Plato, you know, essence is the appearance as appearance, etc., etc. So, somehow, you don't have to answer this. No, no, thank you. This yeah. is a very interesting comment. I'll, I'll work on it. Uh, thank you. 
I suppose I, I chose the term appearance simply because it's related to Plato. Plato had a difference between truth and appearance, but I think with double it could work just as well or even better. Um, oh, Andrew? No, or? it's me. I'm here. Gregor. Oh, Frauke, sorry. <laughs> now I see you. So you didn't run away because no, of I love. No, I did not. Okay. So let's talk about love, right? Oh, no. Um, Shakespeare um, stages his scene of love as a scene of parisia, if I understand you correctly, right? Brutus is speaking the truth through the wounds of, of Caesar. Um, I don't know if you know the, the great uh, picture of Caravaggio. He depicts in his painting like Doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, so so when Thomas penetrates uh, with his finger the wound of Christ's body like this, uh, and the wound is shaped like a vagina. So um, that is a very, in, in Shakespeare, it's very clear that this is a, like a Christian foundation um, of that concept of the master's love, right? And you already answered my first question was, is that so in, in Hegel, which, which would of course be no surprise, right? But it is so, uh, it's so striking. However, what I want to know, um, Christ, <coughs> Um, is dead in order to speak through his wound, right? Or let Thomas speak, or Caesar's dead um, so that uh, B Brutus can speak through his wounds. Um, so would a good master then necessarily be a dead master in order to make the servant speak the truth? Because y you would say the servant is dead, but isn't it necessarily so that the master has to be dead? Well, in Christianity, yes. No, no I mean in Hegel. In Hegel, yes. Okay. Hegel, like uh, Hegel, on this as in many other occasions, understands death uh, through the mediation of Christian um, meth metaphysics. I'd say, like, I mean, you could uh, you could try to defend Hegel and go for atheist Hegel and profoundly atheist Hegel, and a lot of theologians would say, no, Hegel is the worst of theologians. Like, he's really like the worst of the worst. He's no real Christian. But I say that you have to understand, at least conceptually, some sort of what is at play with the idea of God himself dying. Of, of, and so, so yes, you know, short answer is yes and yes. And uh, masters then, then must be sacrifices, right? Or we must sacrifice them in order to, to come to that point of parisia. I mean, I, I think it's very complicated. Uh, it's very complicated because, of course, uh, Shakespeare uses an ancient motif, uh, and he, uh, you know, where parisia is obviously what he's uh, trying to play with. But he's also, as you've wonderfully suggested, uh, he's also making it super erotic. Like he's really talking about sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouth. It's like putting tongue in them. I mean, it's really obviously erotic. Um, and at the same time, it's also obviously Christian. Uh, thank you for this Caravaggio reference. I'll have to double check it. I, I, I actually am fami familiar with that. I think it's a very important image, but I forgot it in reference to this paper, so I'm grateful. Um, now, how does, you know, he co conflates all of these categories, and it's very hard to now disentangle them. So. The easiest way would be to simply read, uh, read that as Hegel would, uh, you know, to just let Shakespeare be Shakespeare and just address it as a Hegelian. Um, and I think uh, what, what, what a Hegelian point here would be, uh, yes, death has something to do with it. Like uh, the idea of, um, of uh, Caesar speaking to us beyond his grave is something that matters uh, in, in Hegel's argument. I think. Okay. I hope another question. Response. Yes. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm here, Gregor, and thank you. It was really excellent exposition. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm maybe repeating too much of what Eric was after, but I'm not sure I really uh, found out how what you agreed upon. <laughs> so, uh, because okay, you can say it's a banality that Heidegger is. Uh, Emphasizing again and again that there's something about death that is always mine. Uh, je meinigkeit. He has a term for that. Je meinigkeit. Yeah, je mein. Je meinigkeit. Yeah. You see, je meinigkeit, Eric. You, you, you yes. tried to escape from Heidegger, but he came back for, to you. Yes, but 
I think it's I think it's probably important that there's at least three different levels of death <laughs> in Heidegger. So mm -hmm. uh, one of them is the verenden, as it's the perishing that Eric was referring to, and then the opposite in a way of that is sterben, which means dying, which makes possible the whole structure of sein zum Tode in in uh, sein und Zeit and this existential dimension and so on. But then there's a sort of a middle category, which is ableben and it's only, as if I'm not remembering wrong, the, it's only the creatures that are able to die in the sense of sterben that actually uh, can ableben. Uh, so when a human being who has uh, an existential relation to its own death through sterben actually dies, uh, it stops to live in the sense of ableben, which is different from the merely creature who just perishes, verended. And in that sense, the, uh, well, at least two points. Heidegger does have a lot of things to say also in Sein und Zeit, a little bit in Vasis Metaphysic, uh, about the social dimension of death, so to say, if you will. And then he just emphasizes, maybe again and again, that there's nonetheless something irreducibly subjective about my death. And I think if you want to like Kierkegaard would say that ein, zwei, drei, kokolorum, and then we make it into a social category instead of something irreducibly subjective, then I simply, I think on the basic level, it's a misrepresentation of what the concept of death involves. Uh, so I think, first of all, the, the, there is a social dimension in Heidegger, and there's still the, the irreducibly subjective, which is different from the perishing of the merely bodily, so to say. And I think this is, for example, I think this is what uh, Derrida then criticizes about Heidegger's conception of death, that he has sort of two clear limits between these different conceptions of death, that there's something creaturely in the human death which cannot be separated from the anxiety and so on. But uh, that's a criticism you can make, but I think an Aufhebung that makes everything into a merely social category, I think is that's not enough. Um, in interest of time, I'll just agree with you in the sense that I, I too, no, 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 uh, in the sense that, I mean, I do want to insist on the difference between uh, social dimension of death in Hegel and social dimension of death in Heidegger, but I, I will agree with you and Eric that maybe I've kind of, you know, threw him under the bus here, that I should have given him a bit more um, time to speak before. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Gregor. That was excellent. I, I so much enjoyed that. Um, I wanted to say that perhaps Hegel has three kinds of death, too, because the, the, the chapter on um, absolute freedom and terror talks about death by the guillotine as the coldest and me meanest of deaths. And I think of that one as an example where it's something like the death of death. It robs death as a natural death and sort of makes it like you're just chopping off cabbages or whatever. The, yeah, it, fantastic. And the, yeah. And the gulp of no, cold fantastic. water. Um, and so, insofar as that's, those are executions, and insofar as this, uh, you know, Caesar was stabbed, I, you know, kind of feel like there's something there to compare the two. So that's the first thing. The second thing is a little bit of a selfish question, but it, it, it's a little bit about the commentary tradition on Caesar's death in, in Suetonus and um, Appia and Plutarch, where there's ambiguity about Caesar's intentions when Antony approaches him with the uh, laurel. Um, it's not even a crown, it's like a, a reef thing. And, um, whether Caesar thought of this as like a test to see if the crowd would want to him to take the crown. And so there's, there's you know, especially Plutarch uh, assigns really bad intentions to um, Caesar. Like for instance, you know, when the, the uh, officials st start to, um, they start removing from the statues set up around town of, of Caesar with that already had a crown on them. And, and purportedly Caesar gets pissed off that they're like, removing the crown. So there's this weird sort of dynamic there. And I'm only saying that as a background because at the end of that commentary tradition, you have Hegel calling Caesar an autocrat. And this is where I'm asking the selfish question, but I think that's a very, I, I'm, I wanna know if you agree with me that that's a strong statement and something, I know he's a world historical individual, but you're really coming down very clearly at the end of a very rich and long commentary tradition about all the ambiguities of his tyranny to come down and just out and say that he's an autocrat where nowhere else does 
Hegel says nowhere that autocracy is good, so you can't just say, oh, this was before you know, authoritarian. It's, it's, it's a very clear thing. So I'm just wondering what your comment on those two things were. Um, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I thank you for mentioning this other passage in, uh, in Phenomenology about uh, chopping heads as if it's cabbage. I'd say that you know, if I had more time to elaborate on this uh, idea, I, I mentioned the curtain right before when I was talking about the master, and I'd say that like the the guillotine is a very good curtain. Um, so I'd say that this, you know, in a sense, uh, in a sense, I'd say that um, the guillotine. I'd say like if I condense it into one sentence, which will sound like what are you trying to say, Gregor? But still, I'll do it. Uh, if if Hegel has a good image um, of a monarch slash uh, master, it would be the image of the guillotine uh, rather than of Henrik VIII with, uh, with a you know, cot piece and everything. I'd say the guillotine is the better image of the king than, uh, than Henry VIII and the cot piece. Um, and about the second question, um, Shakespeare has all that, like he in includes all that in his rep report, like this, uh, this senator reporting, he, he says all that. Uh, and he has Cicero muttering something in Greek, which he didn't understand. <laughs> and, I mean, he has everything. Uh, he, he has reports about uh, senators, you know, Republicans saying, oh, but we can't have like a king. I mean, yes, uh, he's great, whatever, but I mean, he, we can he cannot wear a crown, come on. And then they get executed. Uh, so he has, Shakespeare has that all. Um, so I, I think it's a wonderful, uh, and, and to, like, honestly, if you ask me, I think uh, Hegel probably <laughs> used Shakespeare as his source. Ru of course, he also read uh, all those commentaries, but I think like the ultimate source was probably maybe someone like Shakespeare. But does he mean Shakespeare in the poem the autocrat short passage that he's done with it? That's what I feel like he's done. Is the point like that? It's very abrupt, and it, you know, when he removes that word, it means bad. It's very hard for me to answer this question because I personally think Caesar is bad. <laughs> um, I personally think that, you know, I don't need the cr I don't want the crowd. I think that is really bad. Um, so it's very hard for me to say uh, anything else. But yes, he's obviously an autocrat that, you know, this is just pure performance. So for, for me, it's very hard to say anything other than yes, he's an autocrat. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gregor, and uh, we meet in five minutes at 16.06.